Okay, well, uh, good morning, everyone. We'll go ahead and get started. I know there will always be a few people coming in here late, and I am actually glad that we have like 20 people here today. I thought it was 42 degrees when I got up this morning. I was, uh, good morning, I was worried. Vicky wants to watch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so anyway, so I was just glad to see, uh, see a good group of people coming in today. We've got a couple good topics uh, up for you, and, and I know there's always a lot of interest in uh, anything corn related. So uh, I'm glad that, that you're able to make it. Uh, I don't think we have any new faces in the room, but it's uh, good to see some recurring ones. So um, anyway, so uh, yeah, if you haven't been here before, again, restrooms are down the hall. Snacks are back there. We've got Boone McAfee here from the Corn Board. They're our sponsor for today. Uh, most of you probably know Boone or have seen Boone around, but uh, make sure you say thanks or uh, say thanks to any of the board members and uh, supporting the event today. So uh, first up is uh, Bijesh Maharjan. I said that right. Uh, he's a soil and nutrient specialist out in the panhandle. So he wanted to come here so bad that he got up this morning and drove from Scott's Bluff to be here. I'm just, just kidding, right? <laughs> luckily, he, luckily in the wintertime, if you're in extension, you're doing a meeting someplace, right? And he just happened to be in Grand Island yesterday. So it was uh, glad that we could get him up here. And then uh, following a little bit later, we'll have uh, Tom Hogemeyer as well as Tamara Jackson Zemps. We'll be here and she'll uh, wrap up the day. So uh, with that, again, as always, if you have questions or comments, please jump in and ask. And I'll go ahead and uh, turn it over to Vijesh and we'll go from there. Thank you, Tyler. Yeah, I'll take that. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be back to Lincoln. Uh, before Scott's Bluff, uh, I was in Lincoln for three years. I did my postdoc here with uh, Dr. Richard Ferguson. Probably uh, many of you know him. Um, yes, yeah, so it's really a pleasure to be here. And uh, we'll talk about fertility in corn. And uh, when we are in Scotts Bluff, we normally, in a group like this, have to a little bit ask what growers are raising because it can be many things besides corn. We have sugar beet, dry beans, sunflower, uh, peas, fenugreek, a lot of things. So I assume here all of you are successful corn growers, right? But we do also grow corn there. But uh, today, uh, my intention will be to share some of the data uh, that I uh, collected and published while working here with Dr. Ferguson, uh, nitrogen management. Uh, certainly you must have heard a lot and lot about corn nitrogen management, uh, but let's see, probably some of the things that I present would be refreshing. Some of the things would maybe repeating, but uh, I would also like to hear from you uh, any uh, interesting stuff uh, that you might have been observing or learning from your own experience in your field. Uh, so without ado, let me start. Uh, over years, so this is little old compilation. It's only until 2008, nitrogen use in Nebraska. Um, what we see here is anhydrous use has uh, gone down to only 30%. In Scotts Bluff, I have talked to a few co-ops and None of them carry anhydrous anymore. Um, do any of you here use anhydrous? Okay, fall application? Okay, but what we see here is liquid nitrogen has gone up and there's urea as well. So nitrogen fertilizer, uh, the starts 1955. Uh, as we know, all this use of reactive nitrogen in agriculture started post-World War. Nothing new here, you, have, you must have seen this many, many times for our principles of nutrient management. So idea behind here is not only to uh, grow our corn economically, but also to maintain our cropping system in a environmentally sustainable way. So only if we would know what is the right source for your particular field, what would be the timing and rate and placement. So we'll discuss a little bit about that and share with you some of the research data. Uh, simple background on how the fertilizer work in the field. Certainly there are a lot of soil physics and chemistry and biology involved here. It's pretty complex system, biotic, abiotic system, but still we have figured out that how urea <coughs> molecule gets hydrolyzed into 
ammonium, which gets oxidized to nitrate. And these are the two forms of reactive nitrogen. Uh, keep in mind that there is a lot of nitrogen in atmosphere, but they are non-reactive, meaning it's a balanced molecular form, dinitrogen gas, N2. So somehow we have to electrically charge those nitrogen in order to bring it into chemical reactions where crop can get involved, soil can get involved, and eventually uh, translate into crop production. So we learned during the wartime probably, or even before that, how to break that nitrogen molecule into reactive form. And nitrogen can take a lot of reactive forms. And it's like a water cascade. Nitrogen just, once it gets into reactive modes, it gets into ammonium form, nitrate form, nitrogen uh, gas form, and either it becomes very beneficial if it goes into biomass, or it can create some environmental havoc. We know about the nitrogen leaching and the uh, pollution in the groundwater. So it's very important to track every atom of nitrogen, just like water. Same water from Colorado River goes over one dam, over another dam, and gives some uh, beneficial energy source for us. Same way nitrogen can go from one form to another and create problem. Ammonia form will give uh, atmospheric problem, creating fog and smog. Same ammonia can get deposited back to water surfaces, water bodies, and create nitrate issues. So same, um, same nitrogen can again go back as a greenhouse emission. So same one singular atom can create a different uh, scenario, different settings. So now this ammonium and nitrate plant can uptake, but there we know that the efficiency of the nitrogen that we input is always lower than 50 percent. So a lot of nitrogen can be environmentally lost, either through volatilization, either to a greenhouse gas emission or leaching. So that's why people have been trying to figure out how to improve this nitrogen use efficiency, how to improve crop uptake of this nitrogen. So some of the improvement, this is still about the process, urea's enzyme, hydrolyzes the urea to ammonium. And this oxidation process is two-step process, nitrosomonas and nitrobacter bacteria uh, oxid oxidizes ammonia. The process is called nitrification. Now some chemical arrangement, chemical formulation, NSERV instinct, DCD, these are inhibitors that inhibit this microbial process of nitrification. Why we are doing this is hoping that if nitrogen in this form stays a little longer rather than nitrate, because problem with the nitrate is it's negatively charged. And if you know what is the charge in soil particles, electrical charge are just positive or negative, right? So soil particles, particularly clay mineral particles and organic matter, lattices has some electric charges. What are they? Positive or negative? Negative. They are negatively charged. The soil generally is negatively charged. And negative attracts negatives. Uh, I mean to say opposite charges get attracted. So negative charge attracts positively charged ions. So ions like calcium, sodium, potassium, they get attracted by those soil surfaces and they stay adhered, absorbed on the soil particles. That's what we call cation exchange sites of the soil, CEC. You must have heard about that. But nitrate becoming being, well, nitrate being negatively charged gets kind of repelled by the soil surfaces. So it goes into the soil solution. That in a way makes it readily available for plant roots to take it up. But at the same time, Nitrate is so soluble in water, if there is more water than soil can hold or plant can uptake, that nitrogen will move down along with water. So that's why better to reserve, sustain the availability of the soil by keeping it in this form. And that's why these chemical formulations have been developed, hoping to a little bit slow down this process. 
because once it goes to nitrate, either it has to be uptaken or unless you manage your water properly, it will leach down. And the another formulation is, why not to slow down this process itself to begin with? So then it's called ureas inhibitor. It inhibits this chemical process. And more than that, there's another to even slow down the very first step of urea uh, getting hydrolyzed. So it's a physical process, physical covering of the urea granules so that urea is released to the soil a little bit slower and the whole process will slow down. So these are some of the chemical arrangements <clears throat> to uh, come up with better uh, way of uh, providing nitrogen first crop. And at the early step, there is another, some chemical aldehydes that uh, gets mixed with urea, methylene urea, uh, also hoping to slow down the whole process to begin with. So uh, now I'm gonna uh, share some of the result research data on uh, some of these uh, products. So this is a field plus lab study. Uh, there are certain things that we can uh, do in the field and certain things better to do in the lab for the ease of uh, control and um, many other things. So here we have uh, three-year data using different um, nitrogen source, liquid nitrogen with methylene urea, uh, split applied, same source, and just liquid nitrogen. And then instinct, with this, uh, which is nitropyrene, nitrification inhibitor, and urea, uh, sorry, UAN with neutrosphere, which has both ureas and nitrification inhibitor. So pretty much this is physical, arrangement and these two are chemical these the rest are chemical and it's in a loamy sand and i'll jump right into the field data you have grain yield sorry the units are in uh, si um, and the rates of nitrogen so we see pretty nice cur curvilinear response to pcu and un split so split application is always comes out very uh, nice because as you split the nitrogen, uh, very likely you are providing nitrogen for the crop as it needs rather than put, dumping everything all at once. But one thing really stood out is PCU, which was applied all at one time um, right after emergence, had a greater grain yield compared to rest of the uh, treatment. 2010 and 11, little bit, uh, uh, sources are a little bit different, PCU, same, um, liquid nitrogen, and in between there are the curves for liquid nitrogen with different chemical uh, formulations. And again here, PCU turned out to be very effective. If you look at two-year data, 2010 and 11, individually, what we found was in both years, these are two years, four different nitrogen sources, liquid nitrogen, liquid nitrogen with uh, a new, this is a uh, nitropyrene, liquid nitrogen with a neutrosphere and polymer coated urea. So polymer coated urea, both here came out to be winner in 2011, UAN with or without chemical inhibitors didn't really matter. Uh, but overall, 2011 had lower yield than 2010. So what might have happened here? So we went back, look at the weather conditions in these three years. Something that really stood out, the amount of precipitation during the <clears throat> season, 2009, very dry year much less precipitation compared to 30 year average. 2010, more or less 30 year average, and 2011, pretty wet. So for a researcher, this is like, oh, as if 
we control the weather, right? Dry year, average year, and wet year. So probably this has a lot to do with what we uh, observe in terms of corn yield. And something more in 2011 was somehow when the farmer applied, this, these are data, uh, these are experimental, uh, experimental study laid out in farmer's field in Merrick County. Uh, so in 2011, the day nitrogen was applied, there was quite a bit of rain. Does this say anything to you in terms of nitrogen losses? Remember the very first uh, figure we showed, nitrogen unless taken up by the crop or retained by the soil, they can be lost through volatilization as ammonia, leaching as nitrate, or greenhouse gas emission as nitrous oxide. So looking at the weather condition, can you predict something? What, might, what could happen in those fields with relation to the nitrogen? Dry year, what happens in dry year? With the dry condition, most likely by the evaporative loss, uh, by evaporation, we can easily lose nitrogen as ammonia. In the wet year, it's a sandy loam soil, right? Pretty coarse texture. What happens to nitrate? Unless you can hold nitrogen in form of ammonium, which is very difficult, and that nitrogen becomes nitrate, which is not hold by soil in their cation exchange sites, and a lot of water is there, and nitrate is so soluble in water, it can easily be lost through leaching. So that's why we wanted to just verify our assumptions, which is pretty well known assumptions, but still we wanted to test that in our lab. So what we did was we prepare our experimental setup like this, PVC, uh, not PVC, acrylic chambers. We pack the soils in those uh, tubes. There is a capping system. Bottom cap, we could collect the leachate if there is any. On the top cap, we could collect the ammonia as well as greenhouse gas emission. And we simulated dry and wet weather precipitation. Uh, study was conducted for a year. Uh, right after fertilizer application. So we simulated the rate of application of nitrogen in the field also. And uh, this is cumulative ammonia loss. And these are number of days after fertilizer was added. So what really stood out is in the wet condition, ammonia loss was very minimal. And that's expected because that's what the recommendation is especially if you are applying your nitrogen on surface, uh, on residues, it's very, very highly recommended that you incorporate it somehow, either uh, trying to time it with the oncoming uh, precipitation or with the irrigation water or mechanically incorporate. Otherwise, there are studies showing that you can lose as high as 60% of your input just through volatilization and that happens very rapidly in the first uh, week or two so this wet system so water was really moving nitrogen into the soil profile so there was not much left on the surface to lose uh, through volatilization now in the dry system what is this flat line what what is that treatment pcu so how does pcu works it has a physical covering over the urea granules. And as a function of temperature and moisture, urea is slowly released to the soil. And that physical inhibition seems to be working very well to prevent ammonia loss. But other UN treatments, with or without chemical uh, inhibitors, they had pretty 10 to 20% of applied nitrogen loss through volatilization. Something that stands out here is liquid nitrogen with this inhibitor. This is a uh, nitropyrin, which is nitrification inhibitor. You got actually, mathematically at least, higher ammonia loss than just liquid nitrogen. And here what might have been happening is, remember nitrification inhibitors kind of delays the process of ammonium converting to nitrate. So that means 
Uh, as a result, there can be some accumulation of ammonium. And in the dry situation, that ammonium then can be lost through, through volatilization. So that might be happening here. Next is leaching. We could, we could uh, determine how the nitrate is leaching down the soil profile over days, day two, day four, seven, and 10. Uh, pretty nice curve here, how nitrogen is going down on day two. Day four, more bigger bulges. The bulge is going deeper and deeper for particularly three UAN solutions. But PCU, PCU is uh, this uh, uh, upside triangle. Look at the PCU leaching. It was pretty close to what uh, control is. So again, PCU physical formulation was somehow helping with the nitrate leaching as well. So if you put the data together, amount of leachate uh, per applied nitrogen, days after fertilization, PCU had just about five, six percent of applied nitrogen leaching in the first 30 days after fertilization. Uh, UAN, liquid UAN, and then liquid UN with chemical inhibitors had little lower than liquid UN. So UN with chemical inhibitors did help a little bit uh, in terms of leaching, but not as high as PCU. And that's what really got reflected in the corn yield in all three years, irrespective of weather climatic conditions like dry or wet or average, PCU had higher corn yield uh, compared to any other treatment. So that was pretty neat uh, observation we had and complemented with this uh, field work, uh, this lab work. So, but keep in mind that this was in a coarse texture soil. So any new product, any chemical, physical new formulations uh, has to be uh, checked out properly to see if they work in your uh, vicinity. Uh, in coarse texture, we saw um, PCU work pretty well, but for some it might not work. So we have to keep that in mind. And particularly these uh, expensive formulations uh, are, can be useful if there is imminent uh, potential for loss of nitrogen, heavy loss of nitrogen, either through leaching or ammonia. So up to here, anything you would like to discuss or question? So that's about uh, the source. Um, uh, now let's go to rate and timing. For me as a researcher, if I ask you nitrogen source, nitrogen rate, timing and placement, what is the key? What is the central one to really help you or economically and also to minimize the environmental footprint. Which one is the key? Is it the source, rate, timing, or where you put nitrogen? Any idea? All of the above. All of the above, right. Certainly, but if you have to choose one, which one would you choose? Or which one would you give higher ranking? Or are they equally important? Timing, okay. I mean, there's no right or wrong answer, but just wanted to feel. For me, I feel it's the rate because rate is what costs you. Of course, placement might also cost just throwing on the surface versus knife injecting might be different uh, in terms of cost. But I think rate is something that's central to hold this puzzle because by placing it properly, by choosing a right source, by choosing the right timing, what we are really trying to gain is optimize that rate. Everybody knows if I throw in 300 pounds, that will do great. But it's really the tweaking, fine tuning that rate so that cost becomes minimal and also environmental implications gets lower. So it's really the rate we are trying to fine tune. And if you go to UNL recommendation, uh, there's uh, 
nitrogen recommend, uh, algorithm for uh, corn. Um, so there are factors. Let's say if you're applying in the fall, then it's like 0.05% increase in your rate. If you apply uh, pre-planned, then it's, it's uh, one unit. And compared to that, if you are doing split in season top dressing, then uh, you can reduce it by 0.05. So can you see that by timing your nitrogen input, you are actually managing the rate. Uh, same way with the placement. If you're putting on the surface, which can entail loss through volatilization, so probably to be productive, you may have to put little more than versus when you inject because injection incorporates it into the soil. So you, probably the loss will be minimized. That way your nitrogen will be more effective. So if it is effective, anyway, nitrogen uptake is less than 50%. So probably rate can be reduced. Same way with the sources. <clears throat> if you have, let's say, polymer-coated urea like we saw in this Mary County data, if it is very effective, that means with the lower rate of PCU, you might be getting equivalent or even higher yield than at higher rate of your regular liquid nitrogen. So again, can you see how we are getting back to the rate, optimizing the rate? So let's look at rate. So what we call economic optimum nitrogen rate on x-axis, different rates, y-axis yield. So yield response to nitrogen is curving and then it plateaus. So right at where it plateaus, there's a small increment in the yield, but to gain that small, grain, small increment in the yield, you have to add quite a bit of nitrogen. So some may say, oh, this is the best yield because it's the highest yield, obviously. But to get that highest yield compared to this point, look how, much, how many pounds you have to add. So economically, you actually gain best when you are at this point. At this rate, get this yield. So that's the idea of economic optimum rate. It's not always getting the highest yield. It's about getting the good yield at the minimum possible cost. And of course, our recommendations suggest to uh, account for all these nitrogen credits, residual nitrogen in the soil, uh, your previous crop, how you uh, manage your uh, sto uh, stovers, residues, how much organic matter we have in the soil, and so forth. And irrigation nitrogen. Uh, how many of do you use our UNL recommendation for nitrogen rate? Okay, nice. Yeah, we have been discussing a topic on the recommendation. Uh, one of the hard part of this recommendation is um, if you want, you can do a deep soil sampling to get the residual nitrogen value. Um, uh, but we are seeing that the legacy nitrogen is slowly getting reduced. So um, we are thinking, can we get by without having deep soil sampling? Probably you might heard about it more and more further in other meetings. So timing, fall, spring, in season, all these are their options. Um, in many parts of the state, of course, fall, fall application is discouraged. We have NRDs in uh, close to our areas where there is really high uh, groundwater pollution uh, issues. Uh, they don't allow uh, fall application. And this is my work when I was in Minnesota. Um, uh, my PhD is from Minnesota. We did some uh, split application study. On y-axis, you have urea split, different rate of urea split, and just urea, all applied pre-planting, and po polymer-coated urea, same one from the Mary County, uh, all applied at pre-planting, different rates, and urea with uh, both chemical and, sorry, both ureas and nitrification inhibitor at 180 pounds. 
and these are the grain yield, uh, two different bars, dark and uh, uh, white. Dark one is for irrigated, and white one is for the non-irrigated field. This is also loamy sand soil. And of course, dry versus irrigated, obviously irrigated has higher yield um, compared to all urea applied pre-planting. The rest of the nitrogen treatment has higher yield. And compared to these coating and chemical inhibitors, split urea did pretty good job. So of course, uh, this specialized nitrogen comes for some price, but if you can afford and go split your urea or liquid nitrogen, that also helps. Pretty much that also does the same job as this physical and, and chemical formulations because the whole idea behind, behind this is how to, how to make the nitrogen more, uh, sustain the nitrogen availability for a crop in the soil. When we put everything all at once, there is a good likelihood that you can lose it either way through volatilization or leaching. But if you can split that feeding, then most likely that nitrogen will stay a little longer in the soil for the crop. So by splitting the regular <coughs> nitrogen sources also, we are trying to attain, achieve the same goal as physical and chemical new formulation does. And that's what we see here. And in the dry, dry land, it didn't matter. Did you split, didn't you split? Did you put chemical uh, formulation or new physical uh, coating around the urea? It didn't matter. Why? Why it didn't matter? I put some expensive nitrogen, right? But it was same as urea. Why do you think? Water limiting. Yeah, because it's, it's the water limiting, right? So as long as water is the main limiting factor, nitrogen really didn't work. And with respect to uh, in-season uh, fertilization, now we have more advanced technologies, which is getting more economically feasible, where we use crop sensors to diagnose the crop stresses, particularly with relation to the nitrogen. And they are, these are electromagnetic wavelengths and reflectance uh, from the crop, particularly near the, uh, this, near infrared, we have a very distinctive reflectance signature from healthy versus unhealthy vegetation. So we are just tapping into that signature, which is distinctive for healthy versus non-healthy and trying to come up with nitrogen management schemes. Probably, probably all of you have heard about this. This is a project which I think really make, makes sense and acronym is also SENSE. So using the sensors for efficient nitrogen use. This is a big collaboration between NRDs and um, Corn Board and UNL. So how this is working is, this is also a little bit shift in the paradigm now. All this time we have been given nitrogen recommendation, right? Based on your previous crop, based in your yield map based on your soil nitrogen. Uh, we have been recommending probably you will need 200 pounds for coming up this year. But now from that, what we call um, uh, recommendations scheme, we are shifting gear and going more towards reactive mode. You sense the crop and whatever crop ox you you feed him with that. So one thing is you just serve the meal on a plate to a person. Now this is more like asking how much salad and how much uh, pasta you want. And then occurringly you feed it. And that's what here it's happening. Uh, you put some nitrogen early in the season to help the plant to grow. And then in season, this is something like V8, I think. Uh, the applicator, liquid applicator is going, and that's the boom. And on the boom, there are installed sensors, crop sensors, which read the reflectance. 
and the reflectance are given on this panel. Green line is the reflectance for the very healthy soil where there is no deficit for nitrogen. And then red is the reflectance that you are getting from the corn uh, where the applicator is right now heading on. And then comparing this red versus green, you are recommending the nitrogen. And these two are mirror images, right? If it is very high, close to the green enough, like here, then recommendation is low and vice versa. And then on the top plate, you have the grain yield on the same uh, swath. The blue, I don't know what are the colors, but the one which has more zigzaggy, that's the corn yield from farmer's part. So there are treatments, strip treatments, one based, one with nitrogen rec ap applied based on these crop sensors. And then next to it is as the farmer will usually do, just uniform application of nitrogen. So what we see here is farmer's crop yield is very variable, but the another line is for the crop yield uh, from the strip where nitrogen was applied based on crop sensors. It's more tighter, right? It's more uniform. So we could take out quite a bit of variability of crop yield by uh, applying nitrogen as per the crop is asking for. So this is a very neat program. Uh, 2015, it was started with about, I don't know what, 15, 16 cooperating farmers field. Uh, blue line is producers yield, red line is sense yield, and overall uh, yield difference was not very that bad. Sensor approach lost five bushels in average. But story doesn't end there. But what about the nitrogen rate? Blue one is again producers nitrogen input, and red is uh, sense input in average sensor based approach had 40 pounds nitrogen input reduced, reduced by 40 pounds. That's a lot. And we lost five bushels. So if you do the nitrogen use efficiency, we really uh, hit a good target here. Nitrogen use effic efficiency, meaning uh, compared to what we input, how much the crop up took, took up. And it was very significantly increased uh, okay, answer this. What is this loss? Oh, so here we have not the N U E exactly. I got a little bit confused here with the title, but the loss of nitrogen was heavily reduced with the sensor based approach. And a very quick uh, back of the envelope economic analysis if farmers want to really. Uh, use this technology, how much it would cost with this, I don't know how uh, reasonable these prices are. Uh, it takes about two years to break even in six over 600 acres field. Um, for updated information on this project, you can go to UNL website. Uh, they should have already uh, updated the information on 2016 and most likely 2017 yield data. It's ongoing project. And then I'm going to stop soon. So, but we are talking about nitrogen. But is it enough just to look at the nitrogen? No, right? Because soil physics, chemistry is not only enough. So biology is involved. So the whole soil biogeochemical process is very, very complex. So if you do one right thing, then that will lead to another right thing. So that's why we have to holistically approach the any kind of management in our cropping system. Uh, because look at this soil. This is from Scott's Bluff. So exposed, there is all kind of erosion happening. There's a water puddling, there's a wind erosion, there's a real erosion. So all kind of soil loss is happening here. So just managing the nitrogen, just managing the water might not be enough. So we have to really take care of our property, take care, care of our resources, which are so finite uh, in all possible ways. So um, yeah, our topsoil in Scottsbluff areas, 
some places we have lost up to 50% of carbon uh, since pre-cultivation. So I wanted to leave you with this thought, though we started with 4R principle for uh, corn nitrogen management, but certainly it has to be coupled together with many other agronomic and conservation practices like soil conservation, proper water uh, uh, irrigation management, or maybe we can throw in some uh, cover crops. Uh, and certainly there are more advanced tools available to use uh, to optimize our nitrogen management. And welcome to Scott's Bluff. Thank you. Yes. So when, when you're going through the field with the sensors, uh, we're, we're looking at healthy and unhealthy plants by the wavelength. And we're assuming that the unhealthy plants are being caused by nitrogen. But there could be many other factors that would affect that. And so we may be still applying excess nitrogen uh, in certain cases where even if we're using the Right. Very good question. The so question was in the crop base, uh, crop sensor-based nitrogen management. We are assuming that when you see any kind of crop stress, it's uh, due to the crop nitrogen deficiency, but it can be uh, many other things. Uh, so when we still input nitrogen based on crop sensors, we might be still over applying. Very good point. So to um, avoid most of those noises, what we did was mo all the fields uh, Besides nitrogen, what is what can be a very limiting factor for corn? Water, right? Like Minnesota data, we show, we showed that when the, it's dry, it doesn't matter what kind of nitrogen you put. So uh, all are irrigated, so water part is removed, so water deficiency is not there, and pretty uh, productive soils. So we knew that most of the crop stress accounts heavily uh, for uh, nitrogen deficiency. So that's how we manage it. Uh, so water was not limiting, uh, not other weed pressure or other things. So still there can be many other things. So uh, there were some of the field where result didn't really came out as we expected or we assume and we couldn't really figure out what happened. So in those field, uh, researchers went in 2016 and did more soil mapping because uh, if we can add as many factors as possible in our algorithm when we output the nitrogen recommendation accordingly it will be more robust so right now just reflectance but in that algorithm if we can add soil parameters uh, or even weather parameters it will get even stronger definitely but just looking at the crop deficiency of nitrogen, still the results was pretty encouraging. Any other question? Sort of building off that, like how far away from actual production would that process be? Just thinking around here where we're, we're always water limited for the most part, you know, when you probably need this. Um, and, you know, with slope and soil type change, and you mentioned soil, I mean, it, it seems challenging to apply that into real world practices. I didn't know if you have how far away you thought that that might be to adjusting on the fly to all those other things. I think co compared to other states, it's more likely that things will be adapted in Nebraska since we have so many uh, pivots here. So, of course, it will be also a matter of ease of your management. If you have rolling hills and all that, it will be difficult. But let's say if you have your pivot, and uh, if somebody is doing fertigation already and you just add extra sensors on it and then if you have the capability of uh, uh, variable rate technology uh, then it's very likely that uh, uh, seeing all the economic benefit and as more regulations may be coming at you with respect to nitrogen leaching and all that uh, it can be pretty uh, uh, feasible and and as we showed the economy, I mean, economics part of it, sensors are good. Like uh, when I first started in Lincoln, was one sensor we had, it's different than this one. It was like $20,000. And similar sensors now comes for four or 5,000. You see how 
as technology improves, competition rises and then price also goes down with improved technology. So economically also there seems uh, pretty potential to use these crop sensors. Yes, Tom. How robust is the system relative to timing? You know, right. You showed this video. What happens if you're a week before or a week after that? It has to be obviously a short time. Oh. We get the machine for it, but how early can one go and make gains? Sorry, I didn't clarify that. The question was you collect the data and how soon you have to apply. Actually, that's already the applicator. So it's reading and that's applying right then and there. So it's reading the crop reflectance and then the data goes to the computer in the cab and in a split sub second, the computer output the recommendation and the nodule sprays the nitrogen. So it's right then and there. So, so you're, oh. Right. Machine and application also? Yes, so um, we have a very nice data already on when does crop really needs the nitrogen. So accordingly, V6, V8 is determined to be a very good uh, window for nitrogen input. But with the high clearance applicator, you can go, I mean, when the corn is even taller, certainly, but the point is uh, when crop really can use it more efficiently. Yes. I guess I don't understand polymer coated urea so you now do everything over urea. What is a polymer coated urea? Yes. So what is polymer coated urea? So at, just as the name says, that's exactly what it is. It's a some kind of polymer compound that's covering the urea granules. Is that a liquid or a no, it's a polymer, it's more like a it has a rubber feeling, actually. Right, yeah. Yes, urea dry granules, yeah. So urea is inside it, and it has a cover outside. So it's pretty much urea, but covered with the polymer. So it's a permeable layer as a function of moisture in the soil and temperature that granule urea gets slowly uh, leached out through that a, a polymer and no, typical, right, right right just urea it has a covering yeah yeah that's i really don't know how expensive they are uh, no i didn't know it's uh when we talk to co-op they give us some samples for our research but it's hard to get them <laughs> price on that yeah like chemical companies like I'm doing a lot of inhibitor studies I get bottles of those things but they don't really tell us how much so none of you do any of you use any of the specialized formulation inhibitors or piece? okay do you see any benefit or <clears throat> since it's in the past probably <laughs> in the past it's I'm a dry land farmer okay and, uh, we had an extremely wet spring, and we had an ivy split down. And yeah, at B6, we were out there applying an awful lot of nitrogen. Just, okay. And you put the ESN, PCU. Yeah. yeah, see, with the dry line, it's hard to really uh, see some good benefits. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's why, as grower, we all have to be more looking into, like, just because it works in one place doesn't necessarily mean it might be uh, effective in your field. So, 